Okay, let's get started. Welcome everybody to today's gender study seminar. I'm Yu Xing and Ringo is going to be today's moderator. Before we begin, let's introduce who we are. We're United Proud Women, a uh, uh, US registered NGO. Our mission statement is to empower sexual minority women and to create a safe, brave, collaborative and creative space uh, to grow as individuals, connect with community members, and organize collective actions that uh, drive inclusive social changes. Uh, some news updates, we have WeChat communities expanding as usual, and we have a feminist talk show performance. It's called Open Mic, but it's actually a series of, of performances well prepared by our community members. Um, and our season three is wrapping up. Uh, next season will be season four. In our gender study seminar, we'll be talking about uh, embodiment and how our body and uh, relation in between our body and uh, gender and sexuality. And uh, we have our chatbot that is under development. And soon it's going to be available in our WeChat communities. And here are a list of our past events, and uh, you can also check them out on our Instagram and uh, other uh, public social media. Oh, Tara's here. Hi, Tara. And uh, you can also stay in touch with us by joining our WeChat channels and uh, look at our YouTube channel, Discord, uh, email us if you want to network or if you have some projects you want to collaborate on. You can also visit our website or visit any other platforms. Without further ado, let's pass this to our course assistant today, Ringo. Hi, everyone. I'm Ringo. I'm the uh, course assistant of the seminar. And if you guys have any a question regarding course content, or uh, just feel free to contact me or you seeing uh, in the WeChat group. Tori, can you introduce yourself first? Yeah, of course. Um, so hi, everyone. My name is Tori, and I'm a PhD candidate in sociology. Um, I'm currently studying at the University of British Columbia um, in Vancouver, and my research interests include gender, LGBTQ+, migration, social theory, and uh, also, like uh, a little bit of uh, sort of psychological theories of uh, identities. About my educational background, I did my undergrad at the University of Virginia, and I studied history and economics back then. Um, but during my master's program, I in University of Chicago, I switched to sociology, and uh, then yeah, applied to a PhD in sociology. <laughs> That's about me. Um, I will pass back to Ringo. Sure. And next, I uh, welcome Dr. Anna Huang joining us today, uh, first time uh, in our seminar. And can you please uh, introduce yourself to our audience today? Uh, hi, my name is Anna. Um, I have a PhD in cultural anthropology on Duke. Um, I just finished two years ago. Um, and uh, my undergraduate degree was in women's studies from Harvard. Um, yeah, and and so and my 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 PhD um dissertation was on um queer women's activism in China, so la la activism in China, trauma, sociality, and confrontational politics. Um uh, yeah, and and so as part of that research, um, even before I started my PhD, actually I was involved in Lala activism in China, um specific, specifically with an organization called um Huan La La Um, which was uh lasted it was uh, it lasted for ten years from two thousand eight to twenty eighteen, and I was um involved involved with that organization as well as some other organizations in Beijing. Can I just say I'm a big fan of your work. I find your article extremely intriguing, and I can't wait to ask you more questions. Okay, uh, now let's quickly go through the uh safe brave space agreement, uh. I believe everyone here uh, joining us here today already know about our Safe Brave Space Agreement. And uh, so I'll just uh, quickly go through it. It's first, uh, we'll assume a positive intent uh, and confidentiality means just uh, keep our, what are we discussing today, just keep it in our uh, safe space. And uh, safe, this is, is a safe and exclusive forum for sexual and minority women. And just uh, remember to practice self-care along the way. Uh, if you 
feel disturbed or anything during the seminar, just feel free to take a break anytime. And uh, together, we, that's sharing, learning, and growing. And uh, feel free to start a conversation by name, pronouns, and speak on. Uh, just feel free to chime in anytime, share any thoughts you may have during the seminar. And first, let's start today's seminar by a short book introduction. Uh, because we have, uh, I believe, two books. Uh, we, we selected two ch three chapters from two books and a uh, one chapter from an, another book, uh, which is optional, re optional reading for today. But uh, Tori, can you introduce these books for us? Yeah, of course. Um, so basically, we'll first go through uh, No Future by Lee Adelman. <clears throat> and... Uh, I chose this book first because um, in chronological order, it's written before the other book, Closing Utopia. Um, and Closing Utopia is in conversation with uh, the Adelman's book. So that's why I put it um, first as No Future and then second we'll discuss Closing Utopia. Um, and for the optional reading and the short article that we included in this list, we will use them as like uh, examples to illustrate the points that are made by um, Adelman and Manus, because both of these books are, in fact, really, really complex and abstract. So that's why we also want to um, introduce as many examples as possible. And also, uh, we included several short video clips. Um, some of them are, are, are like lesbian movies that are really popular. I believe a lot of people have seen them. So um, just use them as a jump, jump board to discuss all these abstract ideas. Um, and also, yeah, just again, feel, into, uh, feel free to chime in whenever um, you feel something is unclear or some abstract concept is hard to understand or something. Um, I'm not a, really an expert in this field. This is like, I, I think, belongs to more of the comparative literature and English literature field. Um, so, but I'm trying my, I will try my best to uh, introduce these ideas and uh, yeah, hopefully we'll have a fruitful discussion. Thank you. Okay, uh, so we'll start by uh, chapter one from the first book, No Future. And uh, so can Tori give a short introduction on what does the uh, author mean by no future or a better future yeah or, um, or just or if you want to show us the uh short video first <laughs> yeah i think the video would be probably a good way to start because um yeah it's by, by the way the video is uh from my SNL uh, clip. It's about a uh, media projects that's been going on for quite a long time. Um, I believe from early 2010 or something. Uh, it's it gets called, better it's project. Get better. To show so, LG. Yeah. Um, so I think uh, Tori said uh, it, it gets better. It was a like program lasted like for 10 years or so. It's yeah, I don't I don't really remember when this program first started. Um, I just know that I was there when I was in undergrad back then. So it's probably been a long time. Um, and yeah, so I I chose this video clip because um, I think it really um, and the message of it gets better is really probably can resonate with a lot of us who um, probably, for example, had a hard time during our adolescence and we're told that it will get better in the future. Um, it will get better when you, are, when you grow up or be optimistic, look forward to the future um, because it will get better um, or our society will get better. I heard a lot of um, these kind of things. Um, our society will progress and uh, yeah, just will be more receptive and open and kind of rhetoric. So. Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe we can see if uh, our audience has anything to say about this. Any any reactions or uh, do you like this kind of optimism or uh, like does, does that remind you of something else about uh, similar messages about future or stuff? I wanted to share my takeaway from this reading is just how we probably like Previously, we just treated the idea like better 
uh, too seriously. Maybe our lives is not about being better. Or this whole um, structure that enforces the idea or the concept of better it needs to be revolutionized. Maybe it's uh, the author mentioned the concept of joy saw, which is not necessarily like better or like uh, faster, stronger, that type of concept, like the competitive concept. It's about your life experiences, your enjoyment, or maybe like full of conflicting thoughts and ideas and uh, risk and also safety. So it's like a very conflicting ideas. Maybe this is a question for Tori and probably for Anna. So how do you um, interpret the meaning of joy song and how is that uh, an important concept in queer world making. Yeah, I mean, I think it's re related to the death drive, right? And the death drive is something that is, uh, I'm not sure if you guys have read before, which is the idea of in psychoanalytics that we all not only have a will to live instinctively, like as a species, but at the same time, there's also a death drive where we want to die. And so that's like, it's, it's a very dark force within us. Um, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if Tori, if, if you want to add, <laughs> so kind of add it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, I'm not an expert of this concept either. Um, but according to this reading, I, I, I do feel like it's something, it can be probably conceptualized as something that's alternative to this forever getting better rhetoric because um, there are lots of problems within um, with this temporal logic. So you keep um, delaying, for example, gratification or keep delaying um, happiness for something better, for something to, um, it's a way to like um, keep you grounded in the present moment and uh, yeah, we, we only have this one possible logic often times, like that's the only possible way we can probably, for example, endure the present um, pain and uh, um, all the terrible things is to looking forward to a better future. So I think, yeah, this idea of Jouisson is um, probably important in that it offers an alternative to what we can look for because a better future oftentimes means um, very traditional notions of for example success that's what's um, talked about in the queer arts of failure um, for example if I were told that when I was like 15 I was told that you will have a better future then I will probably think that oh will I be like successful in my career and all that stuff all that image could probably come up but that's not really the case um, so yeah, if we are aiming for something different, we are aiming for that kind of joy of um, disrupting of uh, non-normative, um, like anti-normative or disrupting the symbolic order, we will also get like a kind of joy that's different from the kind of better future rhetoric. So yeah, I feel like offering these kind of alternatives is probably really useful for queer communities so that we're not just limited in our imagination. Yeah. And I'm not sure if this is going off topic at all, but um, the, the idea of it gets better, kind of the idea of progress is something that I, I, I thought about for a while, just the idea of making progress, not just in our personal lives, but as a society I, is, um, very, is really key to like, um, not just LGBT politics, but like all kinds of politics and for like capitalist societies in general. So there are definitely problems with that, of thinking like, okay, society civilization is going to advance and, and it will get better as we make progress and we become more civilized and more evolved. And, um, and you know, since my, my, I mean, my field is anthropology. So we do a lot of, um, do think a lot about like different cultures non, outside of like non-Western non cultures. And so the idea of progress has been, has always been used in a lot of ways to compare different cultures, right? Uh, on like who's more advanced and who are more savages. So we see a lot of, you know, people in terms of like LGBT acceptance talk about like, okay, these are the countries where, 
marriage is legal, whereas these are countries that where it's illegal and like literally making it on a chart where like these are the more advanced countries who have made progress. And that's problematic because um, uh, yeah, it's like fits on a timeline, right? Like it's it's kind of, the idea of is almost like um, I've actually literally heard many people say like, um, oh, China is like 20 years behind um, the US in terms of, you know, like queer movement or something. And, um, but that can't, that's not technically true because um, literally we're, we're all living in the same 2023 or whatever year we happen to be in. Right? Um, and it might seem, yeah, and like technically this is not true. And it also overlooks like how, you no, know, there are differences between cultures. So yeah, so that's just one thing that made me think of how this idea of progress um, can be used to compare um, which society is doing better and which one is not also. And it's not very like normative standard based on like law, what's in law, even though, even though like in some places, you know, like people might live very, freely in their lives but law but but legally you know it might be a different story right whereas in the U.S. I think a lot of times legally there is a lot of protection but there's also so many hate crimes that still happen <laughs> um while like in China uh it's I I think I, I there, it's hard to get actual data on it, but I think it's I would say it's safe to claim that less gay people are killed because they're gay from by strangers. I think that's pretty safe to say compared to the U.S. Yeah. Thank you, Anna. And I think uh, what you just said uh, are connected to our next slide. Also, uh, the important concept of this chapter. So like when we talk about future, we always say uh, it's uh, less better for a uh, better future for our kids. So it's always uh, related to children when we think about the future. So um, uh, Tori, do you want to uh, play the video first or if there's any concept you need to? Um, yeah, I so mean, I can't probably first i will uh, uh can talk about the idea of uh the reproductive futurism and then we can play a video to illustrate what it actually means and what the author is talking about when he's talking about the reproductive futurism so um yeah it's is um defined um this is probably one of the definitions of this concept of reproductive futurism so basically by the words uh, we can see that the, a future that's based on reproduction um so through politics we can make a better future and the future is symbolized by the children so the introduction of the children here um it's not just referring to any specific children or like children as a group but also but it's more like a um a symbolic image of the children um for example we often hear a lot of political rhetorics talking about oh we need to do this do that because we want to have a better future for our kids for our future generation um for example in like a lot of environmentalist um rallies they they keep saying oh uh, our future generation will for example have will not have a, a very good place to live on our earth will be depleted and then they will run out of resources so our children will suffer and they are really sorry for the children well at the same time a lot of people now are actually suffering for example a lot of uh, countries that are um, facing the threat of this being drawn by the rising sea level uh, ocean level um, by the climate changes and the uh, Lots of people are suffering from home loss, job loss, and this kind of stuff. But then the rhetoric focuses on our future generation, our children. So what's really behind these children? How can we and what does it mean? What does it mean to even say, for example, we don't want to fight for our children? It's it seems like almost intuitively unacceptable or moral, something morally wrong is 
not wanting to fight for our children, even though, for example, I probably won't have kids. Um, but still, I, <laughs> if I say in the public, I, I, I don't want to fight for, I don't know, for, for the future or for the children of human civilization, that's something it's probably um, very controversial. So yeah, we just want to play a video. Um, it's, uh, I think, a political message by the United States um, to justify their yeah. violence in the war. So yeah, we can probably see that there are a lot of things going on here. Uh, war, um, fighting for our children, and at the end, there's a mentioning of God uh, in this. So it's a pretty uh, entangled message, um, but it achieves a kind of effect that it probably aimed to achieve. Um, because how can we say no if to fighting for our children or like building a better future or this kind of message? Like it, it's not even possible to reject this kind of message oftentimes. But actually, um, we can see that the war is going on and the American is probably killing some people in the yeah, third world country or something. Um, and justify their acts just using this image of the children. So that's um, an illustration of this concept of reproductive futurism played out in politics. Um, yeah, just probably I can pause here and see if anyone has anything to add or has any questions because these are all pretty complicated. Um, and I just wanna pause before going into the next another complicated concept. I had a question for uh, Dr. Huang. So in your article, you mentioned the concept of Chinese dream. And I feel like that's a very relevant concept um, as what we're talking about here, the fight for children, but a Chinese version. Could you maybe elaborate on what were your observations doing such research in China? Or how do you see that play a role in being like a Lala identified person in China? How did they face such um, imaginary that is pushed on from the political regime? How did they resist or maybe what were some uh, stories or like history that you witnessed? That's an interesting question. Now I'm going to try to see how to answer. So yeah, the Chinese dream, um, I think it was like everywhere, right? In China, maybe 10 years ago, especially it started especially around the 2000 Olympics. So it's so very much about like a nationalism, like we're rising and it's going to be a better life for everyone, where we're going to be like middle class and wealthy and like a strong country and proud and dignified. Um, very much part of like Xi Jinping's <laughs> come rise to power. Um, I think it's not as used as often now. That's my impression, but I haven't been back, <laughs> being able to go back in a few years. So I'm not really sure. Um, it, but I, yeah, but yeah, it's, so it's a very like optimistic kind of uh, campaign, right, to, to talk about the, the a renaissance, you know, for, um, for China and the Chinese dream, as opposed to, and it's obviously referencing like the American dream. Um, for LGBT people, of course, it, you know, that dream doesn't include LGBT people, but like, um, but I think that, um, Everyone in China, no matter, um, uh, uh, yeah, including LGBT people, were also uh, all like you get caught up in that kind of emotion of optimism. Um, for because for a few years there was a lot of civil society and all kinds of activism and NGOs that were allowed to bloom and prosper for a few for a few years in there that even though it wasn't officially in part of the um official content of Chinese dream it was like a kind of opening up so I'm not sure if I'm answering your question so so everyone was very looking future oriented but I don't think LGBT people were necessarily looking at um you know at like kind of the normative heterosexual family as much but but I think that the idea of like, we're gonna make progress was shared by everyone. And I, I don't know that that's, um, and I'm not saying, I'm not exactly critiquing it either <laughs> because I think it can, you know, the, uh, I, I mean, I think Tori will probably go on to talk about how, you know, Muniz talks about futurity in a different way from Edelman. 
So I'll throw it back to you, to you, Corey. Okay, I guess not. Um, so yeah, the next concept that's I think pretty important in our understanding of this article or sorry book is the idea of clear oppositionality. Um, so it says the clear oppositionality opposes itself to the logic of opposition. That's hard to understand, but um, let us unpack this a little bit. So um, in like in thinking about how we establish our identity, there's often a logic of opposition going on. For example, um, if I say I'm Democrat, then that means I'm anti or I'm not Republican. Or if I say I'm uh, LGBTQ, then that means I'm not heterosexual. So there's always this logic of opposition going on because we are defined by what we are not. Um, and by identifying with something, by having an identity, you are oftentimes um, implying that there's opposition between this identity and the other identity that you are not. So that's the logic of opposition. And queer oppositionality is opposed itself to the lo logic of opposition. Um, so that means that. Um, the author is opposing itself to this logic of identity, saying that, okay, so identity doesn't have to be based on this logic of opposition. Identities can be, for example, very fluid, very uh, non-determinant. Um, there's no like necessarily us against them to, in the determination of our identities. Um, and also the queer oppositionality is questioning the eventual realization of our of some future goods, which we'll elaborate later on when we talk about uh, how the future goods are related to symbolic order, for example. Um, so yeah, just now we can see that the future doesn't really always turn out to be good. And the very notion of good itself can be opened to questions. Um, what is good? How do you know it's good? And why are we all striving for something good? I mean, of course, nobody wants to have like something bad um, when there are choices, but this meaning of the good itself is so entrenched and so uh, predetermined that we have no other way of, um, for example, opting for something alternative for what is considered as good. Um, yeah, and then there's the notion of queer negativity. So it's defined more like instead of asking for an alternative that translates negativity to positivity, there's no assurance in the symbolic order. What he means by that is that I remember, um, for example, he, he raised an um, example of choosing, uh, for example, if we're doing a multiple choice question, there's always an option at the end that is saying none of the above, you are rejecting everything. Basically, none of the answers are true or good. So um, if we are saying, okay, we don't want to have this clear, uh, this, this future, this future that's based on the image of the child, then the readers will probably ask him, oh, so what are you proposing? Do you have something alternative that's better that can replace this logic of the child, this logic of our uh, reproductive futurism. Um, but he's raising this clear negativity to say that, okay, so if you reject something, you don't really need to have something that's concrete, that's better, um, or else you are still reinforcing this logic of um, going for the good, uh, going for the better. You don't really have to have, we don't really have to have a concrete alternative in order to reject the, the, the present um, out in the present political order. And also there's no assurance in the symbolic order. The symbolic order refer to just, uh, this is again, a Lacanian term, um, but it's basically the meaning system. Um, if in a sociological vocabulary, I would probably translate that way. Um, there's no assurance in the good that's promised and there's no assurance in, um, what most people consider to be a future good. 
um, although we always seek for certainty, we always want to have some assurance that the future will be better so that we know we know this and then we want to work hard for that better future, but there's no assurance in that. Um, so yeah, that's the notion behind the queer negativity concept. And, uh, uh, yeah, talk again, about pause here. Okay, so talking about queer negativity, I think this are, uh, here's a good place to bring up our optional reading and the uh, news article that Toria signed. Uh, uh, which talks about a uh, queer time and uh, the queer art of failure, which is uh, our favorite, one of the, our favorite material from uh, this uh, episode. So Yuxing, do you want to share any thought on the yeah. queer art of failure? Okay, I just thought uh, one thing that really struck me was like, how come people are stuck in this? Like the, in the in the article, it mentioned that the reproduction system, the heteronormativity, is like a Ponzi scheme, right? They keep telling you, okay, keep reproducing. It's good to have more more children, and more children will keep producing more children, and eventually, like people will die of like I don't know hunger, or, like fighting for resources, and the uh, planet will be like how come people fall for this it's my initial question and then and then we were also talking about this queer negativity okay like the existing structure is uh established it's there but like we are creative people we are creative species right how come we're not creating new things how come we're not inventing how come we're like just stuck in this thing seems like for a really long time in history and uh, this queer this queer space this it seems like it's full of potential because it's everything that what reality is not right like that's the the whole concept here that we're mentioning like the queer negativity so i'm wondering maybe this is also an anthrop uh, anthropology questions so why are people stuck is <laughs> my is my confusion here <laughs> why don't people experiment why don't people like try to create something new like we can all dream of something different right like and um dr huang also mentioned in her article how people are like creating different realities like people uh getting pregnant just by like um fingering each other for example <laughs> like that and that small uh, lesbian play so like all these infinite possibility instead of raising children let's raise a queer garden let's grow vegetables let's consume vegetables let's like do something really creative and forget about children forget about dating men like who is enforcing this why is it like the reality what we're having now sorry who are you directing the <laughs> maybe maybe the doctor hall first yeah sure i don't know if this is an anthropology question or a psychology question <laughs> maybe like why are people so afraid of experimenting with other things right because people yeah maybe that's a maybe fear I, I want to say fear but you know that's and and of course you know just a lack of imagination because I think a, kind of um we really have to kind of be able to vis visualize something right like that's why imagination is so important because it's really have to like um and why a lot of some of these authors talk about art it, it, art and performance are so important because it helps you kind of actually be able to imagine it because we are creative but at the same time we're really also not that creative so <laughs> so it takes a lot a lot to be able to imagine and to like live and it also takes community because it's hard to put every, anything into practice on your own so it takes community and it takes breathing room okay like um a, polit a political and social environment that can be oppressive but um but still within the oppression can be there is enough breathing room somehow to actually experiment. <laughs> yeah. And if you have all that and you still don't, then maybe it's just fear. <laughs> that's, all I can. that's my guess. But like people do die, right? It's not like they can avoid certain things if they follow the scheme. I like, I'm still trying to understand. Oh, children is all about avoiding death. Right. The fear of death as a species, like it's because it cho we have children in order to deny that we're all going to die <laughs> and not exist anymore. <laughs> so I guess a follow up question is how can we stop people from from fearing this exciting new world that we're about to create, uh, create for queer um, space that is different like what kind of passion can we introduce or like what how can we overcome this 
this like sense of feeling stuck for the for the general um, society. That, that's a much much harder question. I don't think academics have the answer for that question. Like that's a very political question. I don't know if Tori has ideas or if anyone else has any ideas. I think that's like something where we have to brainstorm and be creative and imagine like how do we do that. <laughs> so if anyone else have ideas, no. <laughs> I mean, like one thing that queer theory, like um, like women's studies, try to do is to critique at least like disrupt, you know, the stuckness, <laughs> and try to kind of deconstruct ideas that we thought were permanent and unshakable. Um, but that's de definitely only one step of the process, and then you still have to be able to like, you know, um, go beyond that. Yeah, I feel it's really a huge question. Um, yeah, if, for example, if you ask me um, for an exam, I can probably write like many, many pages on that. There are so many um, different perspectives. Um, yeah, I, I just don't even know where to start uh, anymore. But um, yeah, I see in the chat that X is asking, what's your answer? You seem to have <laughs> some, um, answers to your wonderful question. <laughs> I'm going to call the call on Tara. Tara, you're a policy maker. <laughs> what do you what do you dream before you make policies? Um, I, th I think what makes it really hard is that a lot of times you get stuck in just like in the status quo because you're just like fighting for things that are immediate. And I think that that's like a big roadblock to actually creating something different as opposed to something just like that's indirect oppositionality. Um, so I don't know, I guess that doesn't answer the question. I think I, I from my perspective, I think that's just like a major roadblock. Um, but as far as like creating things that are completely new, like outside of all of the structures that we know, um, I mean, I don't know, I, it sounds corny, but I think like just communities like, like this, or you're, you're talking about uh, things that don't currently exist and just, I think that's a start. Um, uh, yeah, it all starts somewhere, so um, yeah. That makes Sorry, sense. <laughs> that makes so much sense. It's like we're suffering so much, and we have so much, so so much fire to put out, like immediate yeah. burning fire. Exactly. So that keeps us from like um, daydreaming. In the uh, quote, quote, quote from uh, Doctor Huang's paper, because we have so much like shit to deal with in real life, and that keeps us away from like dreaming about the a better future <laughs> we'll lose hope sometimes like we keep fighting using the master's tools trying to dismantle master's house but maybe it's like um action in void what are your thoughts tori uh yeah i have probably a couple of thoughts for uh first responding to our first question uh why we not experiment why do we not um having all these queer world um yeah i mean from a sociological perspective there are different levels of analysis for example from the institution level there are just so many normative uh, it's like all the social structures are Hetero, uh, mostly heteronormative it, it awards, for example, a uh, heterosexual couple for reproduction. Uh, you can see from income tax, you can see from all kinds of material. The material world, um, it's rewarding a certain um, form of coupledom, certain form of sexuality and discourage others. They were not taught, for example, you can, I mean, at least in China um, or in um, Florida, not anymore. You can't talk about LGBTQ stuff um, in school. So that kind of forecloses a lot of opportunities already. Um, from the institutional level, it's reinforcing all these structures. Um, and yeah, the you are embedded in these institutions and these cultures. So it's, um, when you, for example, if when you are like 20 years old or something, when I haven't uh, come into contact with all the 
theoretical stuff or all the possibilities I know that existed, I could probably, it would be probably really challenging to um, imagine otherwise um, because um, if, for example, I'm not doing well or if I'm feeling like I'm, uh, um, there's something wrong with me, then the logical goes, oh, then probably that's because I'm not adhering to all these um, normativities or institutions. Um, that's the and our culture is um making us to believe that it's individual spot instead of some structural problems behind all this um and yeah and regarding your second question regarding how we can do that um since we're talking about settlement then my answer is we don't really have an answer there's no definite answer <laughs> there's no um, any assurance in any of the solutions probably we have to keep experimenting and the future is the queer utopia is always on the horizon we can never reach it so um so yeah we don't really know what what there if there's any concrete answer to do that all we can do is just keep acting keep performing keep um challenging and do whatever that is we think are beneficial and somehow I think uh, collectively then there will be social change gradually um, although there's no assurance in that as well so <laughs> yeah I think this is a great time to ask a question that Tori wanted to ask the daughter Huang about the embodiment or like the painful experiences that um, how how can people overcome like their embodiment their reality their trauma and uh Based on based on that, this is a reality, and you pro you promoted that idea that probably people can daydream a little bit and um, try to create a different reality. But meanwhile, that was the reality that they live in. So, um, meanwhile, you are encouraging people to do daydreaming or uh, queer world making. How do you see that in practice? Do you want to, Tori? Do you want to expand on that question, or or should I just answer that? <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah, I can say a few words probably. Uh, so yeah, my question was just about emotion because we've been not really talking about all these emotions and these emotions are a lot of times in, embodied. They are felt and uh, for example, trauma, PTSD, it, it just, our body is still living in that past. It's living in that traumatic past. And one of the, um, the, the, therapeutic ways is just to relieve that past um, according to some for example psychologists so I, I think there's like a tension there um, so if our body is constantly triggered and ground us prison us in the present in the uh, as we'll talk about later the here and now of the present then how does all those um, utopian work out and speak to those embodied feelings yeah um, yeah, that's a really good question. So trauma definitely is holding, holds people back from, you know, from, from kind of being, imagine, being able to imagine new possibilities. And that's also why like utopia is something that we can never ever reach, right? You can never say you're here, it is, it's already here because then it ceases to be utopia. Um, and trauma, um, like you seen's question, um, last previous question, a lot, this is also why people people stay in abusive relationships. Right? People are in domestic violence situations that and they do not leave for like decades and decades and decades because even though they're suffering, obviously, um, because the trauma is familiar and people are afraid of what's not familiar and they, they need to stay there for some reason. You know, for some reason. And, and I think that's the same on a societal level. Um, trauma I think so I think trauma I wouldn't say trauma actually I wouldn't say trauma keeps us anchored to the present trauma is keeps us anchored to the past it's actually from the past that we something from the trauma is something from the past that still has a hold on us in the in the present right um and the what and overcoming trauma is about kind of letting go of the past somehow um and no longer letting it continue um, to exert its hold in, in the present. Um, so yeah, that's a question, that's also a hard question to, to answer. But I think um, something I was uh, also later, later on trying to 
write in my dissert about by my dissertation is how trauma actually um, creates a problem in Lala activism in Lala communities um, because the trauma that people carry with them comes up in like whenever conflicts arise between activists within activist organizations um, and and they become really painful and then people end up hurting each other and have, there's a lot of fight you know fighting conflict that can arise um, and uh, my argument is that part of the problem is that people that there are many activists who join queer or feminist um, communities with the idea that this is a utopian safe space. Um, but it is not because it is reality. <laughs> and um, even though we do share kind of, um, we, we have utopian hopes, right? And politics where this is gonna be a safe space, free from oppression and harm. Um, but in reality is that we all carry um, trauma with us and a lot of baggage. And so people are inevitably disappointed when they find that this feminist space or this like uh, queer space uh, still contains people that hurt you. And the disappointment of that ends up being even more devastating than uh, when you get discriminated against at your job because um, you have different expectations for, um, so that kind of like utopian ex expectation um, is actually um, harmful, actually is more, um, harmful in a way. Um, so it's important, I think, to, 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 to know that that utopian vision is a hope that we're moving towards so that we have a direction to move in, and but it can never be reality. Um, and something else that makes me think of is kind of, um, well, communism, <laughs> the Communist Party of China, basically. I mean, there has been plenty of political revolutions in the world throughout history, right? But I mean, the Communist Party started out very, very idealistic in the early days too. Um, but as it becomes more concrete, like it, it had a very utopian vision in the beginning too. Um, but as it became more concrete in practice and it built its own system and its own political structure, um, it obviously changed. <laughs> so that's something that's really sad um, about utopia is that like it can never be realized. Well, I feel like we are already covering the argument for our next book. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> um, yeah, this, I don't know if we want to move on. Um, Sorry, to I'm really cover the... <laughs> no, 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 it's, it's great. It's a great segue. Um, and uh, yeah, so I see some questions in the chat. I don't know if we'll yeah. ask it. Yeah, so I was just thinking about Yuxin's question. So I think Yuxin's question was why there was no, no like non-reproductive like imaginations or ideals or like experiments uh, done in a society uh, to reconstruct. And I was thinking maybe this is non-reproductive social ideals uh, or imaginations or experiments existed maybe they did exist or they have been continuously existing but it is just not known by us enough um it is not prevalent enough to the society so that we think that they are they didn't really exist um so this is just my thought like maybe this is also related to the reading of our of this week uh, in the low theory uh when the author talk about what is considered knowledge and what is acknowledged by the society as knowledge. Um, so yeah, I just want to kind of like sample some kind of thoughts and circle back to Lucien's question. I think we have later on a slide covering that on the no longer consciousness by block, right? And maybe we can talk about that later. Yeah, exactly. I I, I thought uh, access just <laughs> that's exactly on point. And uh, yeah, we can probably look back. Uh, I don't know. However, you want to do it. Um, but yeah, we will definitely talk about it as a concept. It's I I, I do agree with sex comment here. So uh, going back to the article at hand, uh, Tori, can you explain uh the 
a few arguments proposed by the author and such as critics of politics and the child. Yeah, um, I, I think that's um, like in the middle of the first, not the, not the first chapter, but the introduction. Um, the author spent a lot of time critiquing politics. There are lots of really good stuff, but here I only have this one quote that I think it's um, really relatable. Uh, so it says, politics gave us history as continuous staging of our dream of eventual self-realization by endlessly reconstructing in the middle, in the mirror of desire, what we take to be reality itself. And I feel like this is really relatable because, uh, for example, history as a continuous staging of our dreams. This immediately reminds me of the, for example, the great uh, Chinese dream of rejuvenation or like make America great again. This continuous staging of our dream in the like this narrow historical narrative that makes us believe, okay, so there was a glorious past probably, and we want to achieve this um, renaissance, <laughs> as uh, Dr. Huang said. Um, and by putting forth this narrative and by reconstructing, re, re uh, I don't know, describing history as such we are politics is shaping our perception of reality because we always thought for example history is what happened in the past but in the this context of politics is actually shaping history it's shaping the historical narrative it's shaping all forms of narrative that shape our understanding of where we are now and who we are and uh, where where we are going um this kind of thing and yeah, then there's the concept of the child, which is the token of futurity in our current political system, which I found to be true in a lot of political systems, actually, because there's always this reference to the future. Um, but in the, this is in the more Christianity context that the author brought in. It's the secular theology that shapes our collective narratives of meaning. Um, when you have, for example, no baby or no child, then there's no future. If there's no future, there's no redemption. And without redemption, there's no meaning. Meaning in a very, probably like capital M meaning. Um, so yeah, there is some theology behind this. Um, so I don't know if anyone familiar with Christian theology could probably also explain why this idea is so powerful, why the child is always, for example, the innocent, the, the future, the redemption. Coming from the Christian background, I, I feel like there are different um, narrative around the concept of child. One, one was, I remember there is a, a one, one verse in Bible saying, if, if you have, you can only enter heaven if you have like a childlike mindset. So in, in that, in that word, the child, uh, the, the word child is embedded with the meaning of being innocent or like um, pure or heavenly or non-polluted and versus the worldly or like the, the sinned. <laughs> and yeah, there are different um, versions of the meaning of the word a child. I want to hear what the audience think. It's a very uh, complicated concept to, to dive into. Yeah, well, I don't know if anyone have any examples or thoughts about the uh, link between the child as an image and meaning, um, like life meaning oh. or even true yeah. meaning. Yeah, like the promise. Now, if you think about the the promise to Abraham, where you're going to have like offspring spread all all ar around the world, like um, like stars in the sky, that type of <laughs> metaphor, that is like the promise of God uh, to Abraham, right? That's like so um, having multiple offspring is um, is perceived as something uh, as a blessing, a divine blessing. <laughs> It's so embedded everywhere, like in family and like, I don't know, in science, it's all about like the winning, um, the, the Darwinism of like winning, and then you can have offspring. So this sense of overcoming and, and religion is, in religion is a blessing by God. So like in every 
what the in every field um field by Bourdieu the the concept of field in every field there is uh, like some imagination built around the the children and the futurity of of things it's yeah it's so embedded wow yeah um yeah and I feel like for example when a lot of people are coming out to their parents and one of the problem one of the questions that the parents will ask is uh, how are you going to have child um if you say okay i don't want to have child um it's okay to not have child then eventually they will probably bring up the topic the the concept of human civilization because you know if there's no child then the civilization might be discontinued and i just thought oh you don't really care about social inequality now you care about the human civilization suddenly um but yeah that's something that's like the just by you and not having child, it's often linked to the human kind, um, as if the future of the human kind is dependent upon these uh, individuals. But it's it's a powerful rhetoric and uh, yeah, a very prevalent way of thinking, I think. Maybe this is a question for Dr. Huang. As an anthropologist, do you see um, the concept of children being, being under different narratives and convey similar or different meanings no i think everyone's everyone's point is really really good um i don't know if you guys have mentioned gail rubin before uh, yeah i mean i don't want to too much detail but gail rubin is an anthropologist also like a feminist and queer oh. who, who was writing about like basically yeah like the whole idea of like the subjugation of women uh, comes from uh, reproduction, the need to control reproductive resource um, because you know population that that was kind of in early like civilized in earlier civilizations I, I guess that she was writing about how um kind of the trap oh the oh right it's called traffic in women so women are treated um in marriage and and one of the fundamentals um taboos that almost all cultures share is in the incest taboo like you're not allowed to marry within your kin, uh, with your kin. and the whole reason for that is that women have to be traded out um between different clans and different different kinship clans um and um yeah it gets a little complicated <laughs> and off topic maybe too by too much but just the idea is that like women symbolizes reproductive power and reproductive power is kind of like a really important to the strength of um like i think someone mentioned like you know the importance of population in agricultural society um and so so like you know the the number of people number of people you have in your clan is your strength and and women represents reproductive power and and so kind of the who has control um the patriarch uh co family having control over reproduct the reproductive body of women um do by giving them to others and trading another woman in for in marriage is kind of the one of the key <laughs> functions of early society. Yeah, to summarize it very badly. <laughs> yeah, I know it's Tori. If you want to correct, I might have if I <laughs> remember anything accurately. No, no. Uh, well, yeah, I I think that's definitely uh really enlightening. I didn't read go Rubin in like great detail, but yeah, that's that's uh what i thought of her argument are yeah um and frederick engel too actually also wrote about this <laughs> um which i didn't i didn't read as carefully but frederick engel is also very aware that like within capitalism you know there's production of workers and there's reproduction or reproduction um you know kind of the, the the family structure is what we use to control reproduction and reproduction is key and all of this to come back to the topic is resting on the idea that the child you know is so critical and like such a value right so like in capitalism kind of what we produce in the factory are objects and things and goods um but reproduction produces children produces people and that is very a very important productive function um so people yeah so like uh queer couples who don't reproduce are not productive members of society when you follow that sense because you don't contribute anything to yeah 
So as queer, from a queer standpoint, should we can even can we even say that we don't really like children, or maybe we don't care about children, or like is it even okay to say or think about? And maybe they are just like a thing that we give birth to, and then they leave our body and off they go. They're gone. They're like we don't care about them anymore. Can we adapt this mindset, or is it too far off? Well, I, I don't do know. It. No, I feel it's definitely correct. I, I yeah, I, I mean, in, in actual fact, it's just a bunch of, I don't know, meat or, or something. I, I'm sorry so, to say this, but like, the, it's, I'm being polemic here. And it's, you, you see, if I, I equate child to, or like an infant to something that's considered not acceptable, then people will just uh, think it's, yeah socially weird or something to say such things so that's the power of the child in itself that's a perfect example of like how the child is always imbued with all the meanings with all the profound profundities um and we we can't even think otherwise it's it's I feel socially wrong to say otherwise and i think the chat usually uh share some thoughts on reproductive futurism and uh, do you want to elaborate on that? Well, I, I think that the, the reproductive futurism also implies the material conditions of the uh, power relations of the how the society, I mean, how the nation state try to run the society and how they want to um, regulate their citizens, even beyond the religious belief, beyond those ideological thinking. So actually, um, the children, it, it is not, uh, the children are not only the offspring of the family, but also they are the labors, they are the resources for the nation state, especially they need uh, the population, they need the children. Uh, what they call the children is not only um, the, the offspring of the family, it's about the population, about the population policy, the domestic policy, the tax system, uh, their housing system, and other welfare system. I think um, maybe the Singapore can be a, a good example to show how those uh, imagination uh, imaginations of a report a reproductive futurism uh, works uh, in the housing system and how they use the 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 control on how uh, who can uh, apply for the HDB uh, flats to uh, maintain their symbolic order of the, the heteronormative pa uh, patriarchy. Like uh, in Singapore, only the, the uh, I mean, only the legally married couple and uh, with their children uh, could apply for the HDB flat. I mean, um, but if you live with your parents, live with your siblings, you cannot just apply for the HB, HDB flat. And also their president, uh, the Singapore president also um, signifying um, the, the, the futurity of children of more uh, the next generation. Uh, he said that they have got enough houses, enough HDB flats, for the uh, for the society for the citizens, uh, but the problem is, uh, uh, there are not enough babies uh, in those houses. So I think it's a good example to show that the reproductive uh, reproductive futurity is not only an uh, ideological thing, but it uh, implies the material conditions, and uh, you can see the embodiment in the policies. I think policy making is a realm of Tara. Tara, do you want to add on top of that? Yeah, I guess this is just sort of making me think of a few different policies that incentivize people to have kids. Uh, everything from like in the US, like uh, tax incentives. Um, you don't qualify for like government health care unless you have kids um, and you're like, very low income. Um, and then even like abortion, now they're, they've made abortion illegal. So that's incentivizing having more kids. Um, and it's all sort of based on this ideal of like the, the child as an idea, because once the child is actually born, 
kids don't really have a lot of rights. Um, there's not a lot of policies that protect kids um, or that help to make their current lives any better. It's all about just producing more people. So yeah. Yeah, I feel a lot of discussion um, around why like the child, the image of the child is super important. Yeah, it really touches on the materialistic um, conception of, for example, history of society. Um, yeah, I feel that's definitely true. And that's one of the most important powers of the image of the child for sure. Um, yeah, and I just feel like, yeah, the the author is, I think, a queer theorist, and a lot of times they are doing like making like things that are more like a intrapsychic, um, related to our intrapsychic structure and also those psychoanalytic structures. So, um, just want to, for example, appreciate how um the child is both. Uh, materially uh, embedded in our thinking and also like a part of our, uh, I don't know, like the, our psychic structure. Um, because yeah, actually there's, um, the last point on the slide is uh, the author actually offered an explanation why the child is so tied to uh, meaning and why meaning is so important to us so that, but, the politics around child is no longer possible to refuse. Um, yeah, the author talked about how um, the structure of the ego uh, strive for certitude, for certainty, for assurance in the symbolic order. That's our like um, can be understood as like super ego in Freudian instance, um, all the norms, languages. Um, and it's it's our just human tendency to seek for that certitude. Um, and also I think that could probably answer one of the Yuxin's quest earlier questions about like why, um, for example, why so many people are so committed to this idea, even though um, on a deeper level, it can be seen as a fantasy. Um, why people are constantly engaging in this Ponzi scheme without without realizing what's actually happening. Um, so yeah, if we look at the structure of the ego, then there's we can also probably find a different perspective. That's um, what the author said in the book, I think. I don't know if, uh, for example, Alex, you know a lot about uh, psychology. Um, feel free to chime in or any other people uh, to elaborate on this point. I see in chat, Yitong is sharing something. Do you want to elaborate? My understanding of why the, the religions and the, the governments are trying to make, make the children or uh, seeing the marriage, forming a family, an important, a big deal to... Uh, they care more about the the bigger image um like the the care uh for example when uh, when a korean and the chinese young uh, generation stop to have uh, enough children that leads to the 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 risk in the uh, probably the, the the middle or the end of this century that um we our, our economy will have a big impact because uh, the imbalance of different age group and the lack of uh, new new labor um, so they trying to they try to convince people in a way that they can accept what the reason why people should have more children like they, they they tell us that this is a right thing. This is uh, good for your family. This is uh, what you should do as a family member, because they they cannot tell you the things that you don't really care as an individual. That makes so much uh, sense. It's just like the policy scheme that was mentioned in the article, right? Like you have to like keep developing. Like you have to keep. Um, selling this to other people in order 
for you to have like those people who pay your bill and you get to like rise up in the Ponzi scheme ladder and then become more successful. But in the overall, in the in, in the general like utility of the population is probably not like creating any good for the society, right? Okay. Thank you, Ito, for sharing. And um, so wrapping up on our discussion of the uh, first article, uh, Tori, can you talk about the author's view on queerness and what is an identity? Yeah, sure. Um, so, yeah, as a queer theorist, um, he's proposing some versions of queerness. I thought it's really important for us to unpack here um, because we often talk about the word queer without really um, examining what queerness actually means and different like people have different so many different opinions about it. Um, but according to Edelman, queerness is about questioning our foundational faith in the produ reproduction of futurity and disturbing our investment in social organizations. Um, yeah, there are two parts of it. The first part I, I felt like we covered uh, more our foundational faith in the reproduction of futurity. That's the idea behind reproductive futurism um, and all the political stuff. Uh, it's well questioning that. I definitely agree. Um, and also disturbing our investment in social organizations. I think that's the more controversial part. And that's also uh, probably one of the reasons why Lee Adelman is considered uh, like the anti relational turn in queer theory, one of the important people. And also um, later on the next reading, um, they will have a conversation about whether we will have faith in social organizations and other sociality um, relationality stuff. Um, but here, um, because our, a lot of social organizations, political organizing are based on this uh, reproductive Futurism is based on this image of the child. So that's why he felt like we should uh, question our investment in this um, and not to have, uh, for example, an overly romanticized version of what the social organizations are capable of or their messages. Um, yeah, and that's about what queerness is, is about. And this and the second point is related to identity. And the author said that queerness can never define that identity. It can only ever disturb one. So I think this is really important because a lot of times we, when people ask our identity, we can say, okay, uh, for example, lesbian or queer as if it is an identity in itself. Um, but the author here is saying it, queerness is not an identity. It can only disturb some pre-established identities, for example, heterosexual identities or uh, some political identities because of its potential in deconstructing all the messages and all the uh, logics behind what is considered as identity. For example, just now we talked about the, op the logic of opposition that's behind every identity claims. Um, uh, we are defined by what we are not partly. Um, so if queer oppositionality is about oppose the oppositional logic of identity, then um, it isn't identity in itself, but it's disturbing the logic behind what we usually consider as an identity. So here there's the question of what is an identity. We've been talking about identity. We've been using this concept all throughout our seminar. Um, so, for example, collective identity building or um, what is uh, identities, collective identities involved this and that, drawing boundaries and that. But here, I think the author is um, advancing a quite radical idea of identity by um, deconstructing all the basis of identity and casting questions into the nature of identity. That's, I, I think, to me, that's pretty. Um, postmodern, the very deconstructivist, um, because identities are by nature, um, in nature, very fluid. You can't really pin it down. You can't really use identity as 
um, you can't say like, okay, there are certain criteria behind this identity and if you don't belong to the standard, you are not blah, blah, blah. Um, using identity as a way, as a membership strategy um, to exclude certain people. Um, I think here, this uh, notion of identity is pretty useful in countering that part of using identity as a form of exclusion. Um, but yeah, I don't know um, if we have a very deconstructivist understanding of identity, then again, we have this queer dilemma that Gamson talks about. How do we really um, build a collectivity based on some shared social position? Or how can we mobilize people based on um, some identity markers if identity is nothing? Um, so yeah, it's it's controversial, and a lot of scholars have responded to this point. Um, but yeah, it's a pretty, I guess, typical um, understanding of identity in like queer theory. Um, yeah, and lastly, queerness is an irony. By irony, the author is referring to how queerness can reveal the contradictions in the hegemonic logic in the dominant logic, for example, reveal all the contradictions in the reproductive futurism in the Ponzi scheme. Um, that is a huge contradiction and it's an irony. Um, if we review that irony, why we think something is an irony is because we reveal the contradiction. That's what uh, the author means. That's, um, I guess, three points I think are important in understanding what the author is talking about when he talks about queerness in his conceptualization. And Tori also finds some uh, examples on legislation and uh, queer future in pop culture. And do you want to show us some of the examples? Yeah, that's the, I think that's the fun part. Uh, should we just go to the fun part first? <laughs> Sorry if someone does, anyone who's not speaking Chinese, I can't really find the English version of this blue gate crossing, but here's the Chinese one. Yeah, or do you want to elaborate? <laughs> yeah, I, I feel that's a reference to future. Um, in one of the very, very few um, queer related movies in uh, Chinese society back then, um, I watched it when I was like 17 or something. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that, that was the ending scene by referring to the future. Um, and we can also watch another one, also the ending scene of a popular Thai um, TV drama. Uh, we can just watch like two or three minutes or something. Maybe here? Here? Wedding. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, <laughs> Oh, I guess that's the ending already. So, <laughs> oh. yeah, basically, the, the yeah the entire episode is about their wedding. Uh, yeah, it's I'll play oh, a little more. Have seen it. Okay. Okay, the message is that they have, uh, they got married and uh, happily ever after living together. Um, yeah, I can elaborate. I, I mean, these are just two uh, media representations of queerness. And uh, <laughs> well, I don't know, it's probably queerness if uh, just now we cover queerness, it's not really that version of queerness per se, um, but same sex attraction. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Uh, so we've talked a lot about future. I don't know if people have any um, alternatives, readings or interpretations of these kind of queer representations in pop culture in Asia. Um, yeah, we seem pretty- I had 
I had to ask this brand new question to Dr. Huang because I read about the queerness, um, uh, what you said in, in your one of the article about queerness being used as a method methodology instead of like I an uh, identity. So I was really thinking about that idea. And then that also ties back to this concept of deconstructionist of like um using queer as a tool to like challenge, to make fun, to uh to create, to invent. So that's kind of what um, I assume what you meant by methodology, and could you elaborate more on that? And uh, most importantly, how do you see that in practice in China? Did people actually succeed in using this concept of queer to create something good out of their lives? Uh, I love how your questions are all very like grounded in politics and like you know in practice, which is makes up which is like actually the shortcoming of theory is that it's all really hard right so yeah so um i yeah i in my in, in that in that article i was trying to argue that like the queer politics imagination should be a methodology um that is um you know distinct from you know china's tradition of political revolutions um something that a, a lot of activist friends of mine um have has said said on um, mentioned one one time um a long time ago was um you have to say this in Chinese so uh bu pu or bu li, pu or bu li zhe fei, um which and she was using it to refer to you know what we were doing as in you know our, our queer activism um and like you know we see so many in Chinese throughout Chinese history there's so much of like revolutions that tear down everything and then just build something in its place that is just the same thing right <laughs> that repeats the same structure of dy dynastic structure again um and just a whole new dynasty um but yeah like so um i'm trying to imagine that like, queer politics imagination as something that as something that goes beyond that but you know what to be honest <laughs> i wrote the article 10 years ago now and I was much more optimistic about it then, actually. So sorry, it's really hard to answer that question just because I don't know what it would look like in practice anymore. Um, because I don't <laughs> it's I think I believed in it then when I wrote it, but but now I definitely don't have as much optimism. Um yeah, sorry, that's a really bad answer. Um, but I mean hope, I think. I think I would maybe try to talk about hope more instead of imagination. It's um because hope is always really necessary. I think this might be answering another question, but like, but um no, we are probably all aware that in the last few years things have gotten much worse in China for activists. Um and so there's not much room for like experimentation and trying different things. Um but I think um hope is still really important. Um but hope in something, you know, in something, I guess, I, okay, I guess, and to, <laughs> I don't know, if I'm, I know I'm not really answering your question, but to, politics of imagination is about, is about something, I guess, vague, right, like daydreaming, or imagination, or utopian dreams, is about something that's very vague, that it's always a little bit elusive, so that it never becomes static because as soon as it becomes static then like all these at what like all the all these critiques about identity problems identity politics you know and the critiques about like kind of very normative lgbt politics all uh apply come into place um so um so yeah but that makes it very hard to organize around um in practice because people like having a specific goal to work towards um, <laughs> um so yeah so that's so and i don't have the answer for that unfortunately 
And maybe we can also redirect this question to Tara because Tara is creating like some uh, social advocacy here program here and also building her uni and just uh, got formed. So congratulations. And maybe you can talk about how you use your like imagination and maybe like the instead of like abstract utopia, you made like a little bit of like um, Im imagination. You, you used a little bit of imagination and building that into a reality. Um, thanks. And uh, yeah, I think this is uh, making me think about one example. Uh, and it's like the prison abolition movement that's happening. Um, and really, it starts like people, a lot of people think it's crazy, right? Like getting rid of prisons. Um, but it starts from a place of like values. So like, if you, if you think that a world should be one in which um there's not like a a crime and punishment structure then like what does that look like and then you just like go from there so i think that's like a helpful way to like think outside of what's currently happening and then imagine something kind of sounds kind of crazy um and you know ever since people started pushing towards that it's been incremental steps so like now for example there's like um courts certain courts that redirect people who do drugs to rehab instead of prison so it's like little things like that where where you're questioning things that are are normally just um givens or like accepted uh which is something like prisons which we've had since for forever every every society or I think every society has had them. Um, so I think that's like a good example. And yeah, I think it just comes from like, um, just starting from a place of like, what are the what are the values you wanna see? And then, and then going from there, like what does it look like when you design a world around those values instead of um, what's happening right now? Yeah, I really like a lot of the, the example Tara gave. Like, cause, cause like a world with no prisons, like it seems like a really unrealistic dream, right? Um, so, it, you know, like people may complain like that will never happen. You're, that's that's not realistic, but that's exactly the kind of thing we're, <laughs> we should go for. Yeah, I think in um, from the interviews, um, like people asking Foucault whether, because uh, he talked about like discipline and punish and the, how like this prison is, um, um, is a bad thing. Well, not bad is probably an oversimplification. And he just um, asking about if does he have any alternatives. And I think he answered something like sometimes there are just no uh, good solutions to it. But still, we can, like Tara said, uh, we can make incremental steps towards a certain utopia, even though we may not ever reach it. And also there's no assurance in any of the measures we take. Okay, I think that's our discussion for the uh, first article. And let's moving on to uh, our second reading, which is uh, the introduction and the chapter one from the book, Cruising Utopia, the Zen and Zero of Cure Futurity. And first, can Tori give an overview of the these chapters and explain to us what does the author mean by utopia exists in the quotidian? Yeah, so um, yeah, I guess we have already talked about um, queer utopianism in a lot of our previous um, answers and questions. So that saved me a lot of job here. Um, but just, yeah, just a, I think it's a powerful quote is that queerness is not yet here. Queerness is an ideality. Queerness is essentially about the rejection of a here and now and the insistence on the potentiality or concrete possibility for another world. That basically is a, a definition for what queer utopia means. It's something that's never here. Um, as Dr. Huang said, it's always something that fairness is always on the horizon. It's something that we might strive towards, but we may never achieve. Um, and also the utopia, it 
just doesn't exist in it exists everywhere in our most mundane daily life in the most quotidian details of our everyday life so the author uses uh the example of O'Hara and Waffles artwork um, poem poem and also like a coke bottle to illustrate this point um a coke bottle um when you first see it uh, if you read into it you can probably see like how it is a product of, for example, capitalist consumption. It's a commodity. Every com just be like every commodity behind the commodity, there's labor exploitation. There's all the production processes um, going on, and uh, you can see the all the horrible. You can fill in all the horrible details of capitalism and mass production. Um, but at the same time, it's also um, the utopia exists in this Coke bottle because, for example, the I think the author said the president or the president drinks the Coke, um, everyone drinks Coke, every, uh, like a worker can drink Coke. It embodies this idea um, of almost like equality or something. And also, um, yeah, in every Day life, we see a lot of products and we can read into it and just seeing the here and now and it's here and now is often terrible because it involves a lot of things involve capitalism, for example, or like heterosexist society. Um, but um, there's also potential for utopian. There's, um, for example, in the work of art, you can transform just a very common object into an artwork into um, a piece of literature a poem um, talking about how different worlds can be imagined from this common objects that's my overview and uh what's the so in the next slide tori gave some example on why uh, the purposes of the uh why the author write this book so oh yeah, I think that's because that's the previous slide. Thing. Yeah, the purposes. The purpose? Yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so, okay, so maybe I can briefly go over the purposes um, before pausing. Um, so the, the author is in dialogue with the book that we read just now, the No Future book. Um, it's well, he's responding to two things. One is that book and will. Okay, later, the first thing is the pragmatic gay agenda, which is the dominant form of gay politics nowadays or at the time he's writing this book, um, like activists are all um, advocating for gay marriage or the right to serve in the military. These are all very pragmatic legal rights for um, LGBT people to gain inclusion into a lot of um, hegemonic um, society or like the institutions that are available to heterosexual people, for example, marriage. Um, he's responding to that because um, the pragmatic gay agenda is, um, this is pragmatic gay agenda is about here and now, basically. So for example, if we achieve the gay marriage right, then that's like something of achieved goal and uh, but queer utopia is always something on the horizon we can never achieve it and it's never confined by what is happening here and now on the other hand like the gay the pragmatic gay agenda is often about the here and now is often about very pragmatic uh legal rights um aiming for something that's um concrete and achievable uh, given our current circumstances so he's responding to that and the, um, the second thing he's responding to is the anti-relational approach exemplified by Lee Adelman uh, and also I think Leo Bersani and a couple of other authors. So he said, although the anti-relational approach assisted in dismantling an anti-critical understanding of queer community, it nonetheless quickly replaced the romance of a community with the romance of singularity and negativity. The version of queer social relation that this book attempts to envision is critical of uh, communitarian as an absolute value and of its negation as an alternative all-encompassing value. So he's rejecting both 
the negativity, which is also a form of certainty. When you reject something, you are saying no. And that no is also like a singular and negative, that negativity. So he's, he's rejecting both this uh, negativity and the overly romanticized version of community or society um, that a lot of, for example, activists espoused. Um, yeah, probably Dr. Huang can say, can say more about this uh, later. Um, I, I, yeah, so he's responding to the, both of the positions. He's not, he doesn't want to have an overly romanticized version of community um, by proposing the idea of utopia. And he also doesn't want to go into like pure negativity as represented by Lee Edelman. So the argument is therefore interested in critiquing the ontological certitude that I understand to be partnered with both the politics of the presentist and the pragmatistic contemporary gay identity. So yeah, in both the affirmation and the negation of um, a certain version of politics, you are advancing a, a certitude. You are certain that um, this is what we should do, for example. But he's saying, uh, so if utopia is always on the horizon, it's something that we may never achieve. Um, yeah, so it's responding to that certitude. It's not something we can ever um, reach, no matter how much we try. That's my um, overview of the purpose. I, I, I should stop here. Um, so I, I guess I'm not fully grasping the concept in between uh, the two seemingly oppositional perspectives because it seems to me like queer marriage or gay marriage by itself is kind of queer world making, right? In the, in the past tense, there was no such thing and then we're creating this concept. Um, maybe I'm not just understanding it properly. So like the whole thing of pushing cert for a certain agenda by itself is queer world making a sense because it's creating a new reality that didn't exist before? Well, I, I, I think, for example, gay marriage, well, marriage is something that's been there for a long time. It's definitely not something new. And gay marriage, um, by that sense, it's, so if we want to inclusion in this institutional marriage, um, the, I think the, at least the author is saying it's not really, uh, pushing for something radically new or, I mean, yeah, every action is in the process of creating something, but it doesn't quite mean that every single action can be uh, considered as um, fair world making. Although I don't want to draw a boundary uh, of what is fair world making and what is not, but um, yeah, I, I, the, the, the problems with, I think the main problem is with the institution of marriage and the assimilation of the agenda of this gay politics. Does that mean if we don't accept that being an endpoint, but that's an ongoing effort, like first we take this step and next we go to like a polyamorous marriage and then we can move on to the next. So it's like a um, per perpetual motion kind of like, pushing forward, but then it's all like kind of in the continuity of queer world making. In that sense, then it's it's it aligns with the queer world making goal. Is that a correct understanding? I can I can try to I can try to <laughs> make an attempt at answering this. Um, I mean I think what Ming is saying is um is whether it's not the exact goal itself of gay marriage, but it's the anti it's the lack of being it's a lack of a critical understanding of what we want. So like the the campaign for gay marriage, I think at the time when Munich, when this was, this book came out in 2009, right? So he was probably writing a few years before that and gay marriage became legalized in 2012, 13? 15 in the United 15. States. But some states a little earlier than that. But yeah, but so like, so this was like at the height of like, you know, um, same-sex marriage can, politics in, in the U.S. Um, that he's responding to. I think that's important too. And, and, and a lot of the rhetoric for that campaign is about like love is love. It's all, it's all the same. We also want children. We also want to be able to visit our things. So it's a very normative kind of assimilationist kind of, kind of um, rhetoric. Um, so, so like, yes, technically you can, I, 
you can say it's possible that we see gay marriage as just a step along the way, but in practice, how we, people went about trying to get gay marriage gay marriage accepted was not that it was not a critical um, stance at all. And that's the and that's the and that's the problem that uh, and that's what Ed, Edelman is pointing out, right? But but Minas here is like both extremes are bad <laughs> to put it in simple terms. He's like both extremes are bad. Um, because Edelman is I think is against queer world making. I mean, I don't know if you put it in that way, but because I think queer world making to me, I understand it as a community. There has to be a sociality that you're trying to trying to form. And Edelman is very much about just like the anti-relational term is about all relations is problematic, no matter <laughs> what. Um, so yeah, I'm I the way I say it's probably a little biased because I personally, you know, prefer Muniz and not not don't agree with Edelman's kind of anti-relational thing because I do think like, you know, like activism is very much about community and world making. And that is about sociality and relationships. That doesn't have to be marriage, but can be, you know, in different forms. And marriage can, yeah. I, I was there on the day of gay marriage uh, and one of my colleagues um, at the human rights campaign um, is a trans and he was like we're, we were all celebrating uh, together with the crowd and I remember like she was so angry she was like shouting back to those people disagreeing with all this gay marriage agenda so yeah it's the, the gay the whole in, gay marriage politics is um, often criticized for its um, centered on uh, middle class, white, um, cisgender, um, or gender conforming males and female, more like gays. Um, yeah, just look at how gay marriage, who the gay marriage benefits and who um, it kind of ex excludes. Um, for example, a lot of queer of color, queer people of color or like trans individuals. Um, yeah, there are just a lot of controversial voices around that. So yeah, I definitely agree with what Dr. Huang said about the um the not the uncritical opinion of gay marriage. That's what um is responding to, I feel. It's more about the narrative than like the actual uh, fact that people can get married. It's about like how you uh, build like narrative around that the fact of people can uh, get married. Okay, that makes sense. Like we can use that as a tool to like move forward and then use that as like a stepping stone to achieve something like more uh, aligned with our agenda. In that sense, then gay marriage can be perceived as good for our community? Is that a correct understanding? Yeah, I mean, um, yeah, any, anything can be utilized as a tool for community building and there's definitely no right or wrong answers in utilizing certain tools or um, just taking certain parts of a theory or something um, to build an entirely new um, toolkit that customized to our own needs. Um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I do feel that, um, yeah, Edelman is probably against all this community building stuff. Oh, um, and so I don't know why we're talking about queer world building all the time is because in our first um, episode with with read uh, Lauren Berland and Michael Warner's piece, Sex in Public, um, and queer world building is in that article. So that's why <laughs> We've been talking about the concept all the time, just the background information. So technically, we can't frame everything into anything into this concept of queer world making, as long as it's like something new and adventurous. And we can like use that as exactly as what uh, Dr. Huang mentioned in her article, right? like use that as a methodology to create something new. Okay, so uh, moving on, uh, can Tori explain some of the key ideas the author mentioned uh, in these two chapters and also uh, the No Longer Conscious by blog mentioned earlier tonight? Um, so yeah, there are some key concepts that I feel um, I can explain a little bit to help us better understand 
the book, um, the first idea is this idea of causality. It's a certain mode of non-being that is eminent, a thing that is present but not actually existing in the present tense. Um, so yeah, it's related to the idea of being, for example, on the horizon. It's not there yet, um, but it, there's a potential in that, the potentiality. Um, but like ontologically, it's not here yet. Um, and I think this idea is also related to the idea of the performative because performative, um, a performative utterance is an utterance, uh, a speech that brings something into being, for example, um, like um, some in, in like marriage, people say, oh, I, I, I announce you as my uh, husband or wife, then with that speech, then it comes into effect, that relationship come into effect. Um, so that's what we mean by perf performative in a scholarly sense. And also like the idea of street time um, is that there's no future, but the here and now of our everyday life. I think we've read street time in the, in one, in the short article that we assigned, um, how time, how temporality itself is um, structured by heteronormativity. Um, we only look at, for example, here and now, what's the most um, pra the pragmatic, the most normative um, present tense, but no imagining of alternative um, possibilities, such as queer world making. <laughs> um, and the only futurity promise is that of reproductive majoritarian heterosexuality, the spectacle of the state, refurbishing its ranks through overt and subsidized act of reproduction. Again, we are back to this topic of reproduction. Um, I think here um, it, it's it's also echoing Eidelman that uh, the future is <laughs> future is full of is premised on reproduction and this reproductive futurism. So um, that's the straight time. We only see how future, uh, how, for example, reproduction and um, there's only one version of future, um, having kids, um, aging, and our kids growing up, they have kids, um, and that uh, goes on and on. That's about the idea of the straight time. Um, and also the past as performative, means that instead of the past being like history as something set in stone, something that's unchangeable, something that's written in the textbook, um, but it's actually performative. So instead of being fixed, past can actually do things. For example, it helps us to imagine a utopian future or um, it helps to um, facilitate certain political agendas in that way it's performative in that it helps to um even though it already happened but it realized a function and bring some of reality into being um yeah and then the last concept is the no longer conscious by block um and we'll elaborate more on the next slide i believe um but before that we can probably pause here and see if anyone has questions or comments or anything or if uh, i see you like post, post it in chat and do you want to elaborate on the debate around gay marriage and sex, sex marriage um okay so about the um gay marriage or, or what we call the same sex marriage well actually i think there is a little bit difference between what we call the gay marriage and the same sex marriage um i mean it's it's like that the the actually the law has uh, had never regulated the sexuality of who can get married but it's regulated um the the potential i mean like the proper sex the proper gender of the, the couple so i think like the gay uh, marriage uh, by calling the, the same-sex marriage as the gay marriage, it has already romanticized uh, the meaning of marriage, like uh, based on the package of love, of intimacy, and also um, of the, uh, some kind of um, um, recognizing, uh, recognition of identity that based on the sexuality. 
So actually, the, uh, around this debate is the, uh, about what, uh, how we will the marriage is the marriage itself, uh, no, whatever uh, the, the sex of the marriage uh, couple uh, itself uh, is the, the institution and the foundation of the social structure or only the heterosexual and the reproductive monogamy can be the social institution and the foundation of social structure. And uh, based on that, it depends how we will the um, same-sex marriage, whether it is also, uh, it is a way to incorporate LGBTQ people into those, uh, into this social institution, or it's just um, uh, beyond the, the existing uh, social institution to render the LGBTQ people with more uh, potential options. So uh, based on that, it, it depends on how we will the same-sex marriage. It's, uh, it's a way of um, um, queer options and uh, queer work making or as a way to incorporate the what we call the queer people into a more um, normative uh, structure. I see. So it's more like if you marry uh, people because of the uh, so-called love or intimacy or whatever, that it's like conforming versus if I like just marry random people like Ringo and I get married tomorrow, then that's like a queer world making kind of um, framing because in that sense, we're not really conforming. We're just like creating a different possibilities of like, why don't we get married as friends or like in that sense it becomes like a different reality then that is queer world making is that my correct interpretation of what you just shared oh sorry um no i'm not means that marriage is only about love so when we get married because of love uh, so you you are um you are trying to incorporate what it calls the mainstream value. So actually, we when we count the, the marriage as the social institution, it can be the foundation like the foundation for the tax system, the policy, uh, the, the population policy, um, the welfare policy, the public health care policy, and also um, like the what uh, the housing system. So uh, it's not only about the law. Uh, when we uh, when we try to pursue the rights to get married uh, and calling the same sex marriage as gay marriage, it it means that the the, the LGBTQ people they try to reinforce the package of love and sexuality. It doesn't mean that the marriage is only about love. Uh, marriage marriage is not just the uh, about the feeling, about the intimacy. It's about the foundation uh, for other laws and the policies. And um, that's why I, I wonder uh, whether uh, how you will the marriage is only the, uh, the, the marriage, the heteronormative marriage uh, can be the social institution or on, uh, on the marriage itself can be the social institution. And based on that, uh, it, uh, it's, um, I mean, uh, based on that, uh, it means how you will the same-sex marriage is a kind of a progress thing that to try to render uh, LGBTQ people the same, the equal civil rights as the mainstream people more with more potential options where it try to incorporate the, the, um, the same-sex, uh, <laughs> try to incorporate the LGBTQ people into the heteronormative order. Uh, so this is the difference. I just had a really fun idea. Like, what if like they let us into the system, like hoping that we can conform, but like actually we're like the pollutants of the system because like we bring in friends and we get really creative about our marriage. <laughs> like we do like, it's like they opening up a Pandora box so we can do whatever with the marriage system. Like, we can potentially like jeopardize it or like that's... <laughs> I see Tara responding. Yes, it's like they let loose a hole where we can like sneakily go in and like destroy the thing. Maybe Tara can talk more about it. Yeah. No, I I just I I agree with everything that y'all y'all are talking about, and I think it it really is just uh like queer the idea of like queer marriage is basically just disrupting the the patriarchy.
patriarchal heteronormative version of marriage, which essentially exists to, uh, you know, promote like a free reproductive labor, free domestic labor. So like anything that goes against that would be, uh, I guess, queer world making, because uh, you're changing the institution of marriage into something different. So. Yeah, like originally they just got married because of love or whatever reproduce, and then we queer come in and like disturb the whole reality of that. I guess <laughs> there are some people are not happy with the symbolic meaning behind marriage that <laughs> that we purposefully sneakily destroy it. <laughs> This also ties back to our reading about queer art of failure, right? It's about like making chaotic um, uh, situations or like challenge or like creating some risks or like disturbance of the current social order. I don't know if uh, Dr. Huang or Tori want to speak to that. Yeah, um, well, I can speak uh, a few words on that. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm of course, very uh, excited about the potentiality that, uh, for example, the, the whole opens up or anything um, that can be turned into a queer project. Um, but at the same time, I feel like often I'm trapped by the material condition, the, the institutional aspects of uh, what's, for example, behind marriage. Um, for example, even though same-sex marriage is legalized across all states, um, it's, but like, there are so many obstacles in getting married. Um, when you think about all the procedures and citizenship requirements, all the, um, and once you are married, probably you have you go into this household, then you are taxed. Uh, lots of things that come with that. So that's also, I feel the power, the normative power, and the constraining power of marriage is that even though you can get married but it's still um you are still facing this whole lot of um material constraints and dealing with all the institutional things that um just by the virtue of getting married it's hard to um for example just subvert all these um institutions that built around sexual sec uh, heterosexual marriage um that's in place so yeah so I feel like we probably need a more fundamental challenge to the all the structural forces that are intertwined um, in giving rise to the power of marriage as an institution. So wrapping up our, our discussion for the second book, uh, what's the takeaway messages the author gave us? So yeah, the, the author is saying that so how can we um, pursue this utopia is that by turning to the no longer conscious as an essential route for the purpose of arriving at no not yet there, um, not yet here, a turn to the past for the purpose of critiquing the present. Um, so yeah, just now we talked about the no longer consciousness, um, the no longer conscious, sorry. Um, and I remember um, what X said um, in the chat a while ago that um, probably in the history or in the other cultures, there are alternative arrangements that were proved to be possible that were once popular, but no longer here in our capitalist uh, neoliberal um, society currently we are living in. So um, we're we need to turn to those no longer conscious as an essential route to arrive at the utopia, although we can never actually arrive, but it's a way, it's a method to uh, look at these, um, it's a pathway, it's a perspective. Um, for example, um, workers' alienation, now we're no longer talking about how, it, well, yeah, in labor's union and a lot of other contexts, we're still talking about workers' alienation, but it's now, no longer as, for example, popular as in the 1960s and 70s, um, all the protest and uh, discussion around capitalism. Now, like a lot of us are just super assimilated into the system. So that, that becomes something that's um, no longer conscious. Lots of other examples too in the um, 
course of queer movement, for example, queer people of color, um, voice become diminished. Um, yeah, so in the course of time, there are things that are lost. So if we want to imagine the future, we can turn back to those things and see what are some of the alternative possibilities. Um, that's one of the message. Um, and again, just seeing queerness as a horizon and refuse to dwell in the pre um, poisonous present. The, the present is a prison that traps us. That's um, a lot of times horrible. And uh, um, so, but we can't just dwell in it. We have to um, see the horizon, see the queerness um, always there, uh, find evidence from the most quotidian things. Um, and yeah, just strive for it, even though knowing that we can't ever reach it, uh, that mindset. Um, and also the importance of doing and performing action. Um, that's the only possible way to um, change, basically. If you are just sitting there waiting for changes to happen for the present to change on itself, it's probably not gonna happen. Um, but actual doing and performing and challenging. Um, that's the essential way out. Yeah, that's some of the um, message. I guess I also have a question for Dr. Huang regarding um, the no longer conscious. I wonder, since you have been doing activism in China for 10 or so years, and that you have also been at the academia for a really long time, producing really knowledge, um, valuable knowledge. So um, along the way, have you witnessed any like for things being forgotten, valuable historical facts being forgotten? Or if you you think you still, there is some outstanding um, historical moment or concepts that you think we can probably try to preserve? Uh, anything being forgotten? Or do you mean like, Valuable, yeah. like queer assets, basically. Assets. <laughs> um, yeah, I think in, with our, in Chinese, uh, like kind of la la word itself is pretty new, right? And there's definitely very little um, historical memory <laughs> um, already. And, and yeah, um, I think, um, Time has gone by really quickly, and you know, and all of a sudden everything's like ten years ago. Um, so I'm like already on the older generation now, and um, with people who are like, and a lot of lalas who are you know in the community now are like in their twenties and very young, and um, I get the sense I don't have much of a sense of what you know what um, has been done before and what the community was like before. And that's definitely, um, you know, a loss. And that and that lack of continuity is a, is structural. It's because, um, you know, we had to always had to be not very public. We had always to be very careful, not that secretive, but still very underground, <laughs> so that you know we don't get shut down. And and so that's um, and that's why there's very little like institutional like continuity. Uh, for people to hold on to. Um, I think that culture, that Lala culture has changed a lot. Um, I, I'm i not actually that familiar with what that Lala culture is now, now because it's like a whole new thing that I cannot, that I'm too old to keep up with. But I can tell it's changed a lot um, from what it was before. I, I mean, like for example, I hear a lot of like critique of how of like teas <laughs> and how things used to be, um, which which is interesting. I mean, it reflects um, you know a generational difference, but also that just that you know there's there's not much of a like learning from elders at all tradition you know at all in Lala culture, because um, <laughs> a lot of the older people kind of um, are no longer active right in Lala culture. It's a very young culture, and therefore. Um, and therefore, um, yeah, it's hard to kind of have that conversation between people of different ages and past 
passed down experience, even mistakes we've made, right? It still needs to be passed down. <laughs> um, another thing is like, even I think when I was, uh, you know, 10 years ago when I was still younger, there were so many, a, a, lot, a lot of our, a lot, uh, there was a really powerful need in Lala community to see older role models, to see that it was a possibility for Chinese Lala's to be old and like what 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 it's like you know and we try to do a lot of organize to do some kind of cultural build make world making around that <laughs> and i think that's still even lacking right because we can all see um you know you know there are plenty of white people uh, who we can see on media but how whether how it's possible for chinese um lalas to grow old and still without being having to be subsumed into heterosexual marriage and families is something that we um, don't get a chance to see yet. And there's a, um, yeah. And also just historically, I think there's still a lot of historical work that hasn't, that hasn't been done yet of, um, because in China specifically kind of, you know, homosexual identity is it's a, such a modern phenomenon that didn't um, follow the same kind of history as the West. And um, you know, there are people who have tried to do a little bit work with like zi shu, zi shu nu, uh, or with like nu shu, like women's writing um, that contain a lot of same sex hints. I have a, all this like historical archival discovery um, is kind of a, is um, really important to, I guess, Western homosexual kind of I, politics because of that kind of, um, because it creates this narrative of a past, like of a lineage, even though it is um, definitely a narrative because um, it was not the same identity, but I think it does have serve a purpose for a community to know that we've always been here and to know that um, what we might look like when we're old. Yeah. I also had a follow-up question. So where are the older lesbians? I mean, <laughs> they still are lesbians, hopefully. Yeah. Well, so. well, all, all, all my, like I have plenty of friends who are in the 40s now. <laughs> they're, still, they're still around. They know they have gotten, most of them have not gotten married to men. They're still around. But yeah, but I mean, that, that is a culture, a, a question of the culture because the culture is so young. Um, and that like, yeah, that's that's a really good question. I don't know what, what they are. Besides the people I already know, I don't know where the rest of them are either. Um, yeah, so I mean, it, it lacks, you know, there's there's not organized community spaces for them. But um, why do you think the older uh, lesbians or lalas, why do they um, just do, do not no longer participate in community events or like why did they um, just, uh, I don't know, go into domestic life or why <laughs> did, is that a purposeful choice or? They have to still exist. So where are they, and why? Why do they make such decisions? By older, you mean people in their thirties, forties? Is that what you mean? <laughs> like all generations, maybe seventies, eighties. Where where are the seventies and eighties? That is actually um sixties, seventies, eighties. That 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 is actually um much much more rare because of you know the like historical reasons. Right? Like they of course they existed, but like they would they never had a community to begin with. Uh, when they were they when they were young, so like, so therefore they're not gonna be you know necessarily finding community now. But yeah, people in the 30s, 40s, even 50s, um, we're definitely all still around. <laughs> um, I, I, yeah, that's a complex question. I don't know. It's, it could be a really interesting research project, and um, I think it would be a very a great um, like actual project for people to organize and to provide spaces where for because i mean i mean like older you know someone who's 40 uh, probably wouldn't show up to to community events with a bunch of 20 year olds <laughs> very often just because you know we're at a different point in their lives and yes you're right some people are just living domestic lives um 
<laughs> but there is really is a lack of like community uh, options for them too. Maybe Tori can also comment on that. Maybe your future research can be one of your research efforts can be on that. I've that that would be really interesting. Um, I I don't I don't really know anyone who's like above forty five, say. Um, who's also like identified as Lala or something. Um, yeah, I don't know. I just. Um, yeah, I feel like growing up, yeah, even like in my generation, the early 90s, um, like, I, I don't want to underestimate the barriers and all the forces that stop people from exploring their identities and uh, coming to terms with it. It's, it's really hard, especially in like not big cities, like, I don't know, some of the much more um, in metropolitan cities. Um, like, yeah, if I, yeah, I don't know, if I stay in China or um, all the time or subjected to a very different environment, I probably don't have the courage to assert my identity either. Like, even in the United States, I, I struggled so much, like I, came out in like 24 after all these years of struggle so I don't want to underestimate the challenges and the barriers and all the forces that um, could potentially deter people from exploring their identities fully um, I feel it's it can be really really challenging just um, from my personal experience um, and I'm already the fortunate um once so yeah like um i i feel the the institution is really powerful in um in affecting people's choice for example getting married um yeah just a lot of um for example lesbians married with gay men and uh, have kids um uh, and assimilate into that kind of uh, heteronormative lifestyle or like yeah, never come up uh, or something. So, yeah, it can be. It, yeah, I, I, I just can't um, imagine all the challenges if you are, for example, growing up in the seventies or something as the highly stigmatized uh, identity. Uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I that that's an empirical question. I probably have to like do interviews to see. <laughs> Uh, what's their motives or what's their life experience before I can make any generalization. I do, I do know of um, there's been many oral history projects um, that Lala's have done and Lala and, and some of them are specifically about older Lala's. Um, yeah, but of course, like they're very small scale, so you probably have never heard of like these projects, and you know the oral history is only published in like little pamphlets that are hard to find. <laughs> Maybe, um, Doctor Huang, once you identify those, you can like share it with a group or post it somewhere, so we can all go and learn about our historical lineage, and uh, try to salvage some of the no longer conscious uh, facts. Sure, I think I actually there's this person Yu Shi in Chengdu who has who's done a lot of like she I think she regularly writes blogs or, or something. Yeah, I'll try to find it on like she because she runs a bar, a lesbian bar, and has like collected older Lala stories for decades, and she's probably like at least fifty now, maybe more. Yeah, I think that's our today's agenda, right? Yeah. Uh, before oh. uh the conclusion. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Tori has some additional readings for us. Yeah. I I won't spend too long on this. Uh, just some readings that the book has been talking about. The article has mentioned. Um, uh, Queer Times. It's um by um Carla Frasero. I don't know how to pronounce her name. A very prominent um theorist on queer time in queer time. Um, and also Judith Haverstam in a queer time and place. Um, we've read her book or uh, their book, sorry, um, the the queer art of failure. So 
um, I would highly recommend other books as well. It's all very um, easily understandable and also um, very insightful. Um, and lastly, uh, if anyone's interested in the concept of death drive, I'm pretty interested. I, I don't know about um, other people, uh, but uh, I would recommend reading uh, Baudrillard's work, Symbolic Exchange and Death, talking about, for example, um, terrorism and how this, how that uh, kind of disrupt uh, the symbolic order and capitalism and stuff. Um, so yeah, that's my some of my recommended readings. Um, I won't go into details. <laughs> Maybe we can open up the floor for a few more questions or discussions before we wrap up. I had a question for Yu Jue Lao. Yu Jue Lao seems all like very peaceful, and uh, I don't know what is your take on the death drive and like the whole chaotic situation or queer world making like challenging normativity. I hardly uh, hardly hear you talking about those concepts. So maybe if you want to share your take, I'm just out of my own personal very curiosity. I mean, uh. Actually, I think I'm not that peaceful, but I try to keep a balance between the queer ideology and uh, the the like the civil rights for the LGBT people in reality. So, mm -hmm. um, I mean, sometimes the chaotic world making uh, is it's really um hard thing. I mean, they are flexible to catch up with and in the real world. That's what they call the, maybe the, the same sex marriage, like a, a part of the civil rights uh, and like the legal protection that is more uh, practical and uh, visible in the reality. So actually I think I'm not that peaceful. I'm just uh, maybe a little bit negative or a little bit, um, but more, uh, focus on the realistic thing that people can easily handle the, the flexibility and the dynamic thing. So, so the, I think that maybe I I can be queer as some aspects, but I'm not radically queer enough, especially in the work making project. But thank you for your continuous sharing on He Ying Zhen. We, uh, that, that person came up a lot in our conversations, actually. That opened up a whole lot of possibilities on, in, in our lives. And uh, we were talking about um, the out of conscious. And I think, yeah, that was one of the examples that we brainstormed during the prep uh, process. Dr. Huang, I really enjoyed your comments and the sharing. And we, we really want to hear about all of your experiences and stories working with the community for so long. You must have experienced a lot of like dramas, I don't know, like stories or like drama um, and the fun stories, right? And like the, all, all of those. And maybe you can like do a specific sharing of those uh, valuable experiences working with Chinese queer community. Yeah, any specific areas that you might want to hear about? <laughs> yeah, in the paper, it was all about like uh, people experiencing all types of trauma. And there was this concept of um, melancholy versus loss because people could not experience, um, they could not describe their loss. They don't even know what they have lost. So it seems like it's so rich in content that there must be like rich stories behind those as well. Like there are vivid lives, living examples. So I'm like really curious to see what were your experiences. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was because I, yeah, I heard so many stories and saw so many people who really had that because of like, you know, like a best friend who was their college roommate who they slept together every single night and cuddled every day and you know had sex and then loved each other so much but then uh could never call that a romantic relationship and so like when you know but so when, when that relationship ends it's when it's something that you cannot name that you cannot even name what you lost it becomes you know like a uh, a melancholy that that really, that really like haunts, haunts them. And that was a pretty common story that happened a lot when, you know, um, and I think, yeah, it is a bit of a generational difference because nowadays there's so much social media that like 
I think it's less common for people to not be able to find that community and the word and that and that identity right which is like yeah it's funny so 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 like we can critique identity politics all we want but identity politics is still extremely powerful and and does it like it's it put it has a really important function for a lot of people in their lives despite all its shortcomings um so so it's not something i think i i would think it's not something to just like throw out completely but rather to just like be aware of it and it's because it has a really really important impact um on people's lives yeah so yeah i had yeah there were a lot i i, I think i saw <laughs> I, I know so many people would like you know who really have like sad stories like that right but then once um you know the way that i meet them is also like through this um video workshop that that um, I led for a while where people will make a video about a story of their own and and through that process right that process of like narrative creation um, a lot of people actually do feel much better and, and just because if they are like accessing this kind of workshop that means they're finding community they're finding a lot of community in a way um, that also is opening up a whole new world um, yeah which is I mean the whole the whole purpose of that. Um, yeah, all well, the stories. Yeah, I mean, people just choose to live their lives in very different ways, but um, yeah, I don't know if you have, you know, <laughs> if it, it, I, I'm sorry, if you have any specific other things that you want to hear, I, maybe that can give me some <laughs> clues. Maybe what is your uh, vision for queer world making? What do you want to, um, what is your current endeavor? And maybe uh, how have it changed over the past few years? And how are you taking this effort moving forward? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, I, nowadays, I think I'm much more interested in like uh, trauma and repair. Um, so I think, um, you know, maybe 10, 15 years ago, I was much more interested in that kind of critique and that kind of like very angry politics of breaking everything down and <laughs> and going against the normative, um, which I don't haven't changed my mind about those values, but it don't, it's no longer like the priority for me because um, I think what I, I guess over time, what I found, um, what became more and more interesting to me is like um, that, you know, for for people to um for all these queer people to actually like live to live um to live good lives it, there's a lot of trauma that has to be repaired and there's a lot of trauma comes from queer identity um and there are very yeah and like critique only goes so far that's i guess maybe my biggest shift and repair is so is a whole nother thing that not not a lot of queer theorists have read about except maybe Eve Sedgwick um, has um, yeah um, Eve Sedgwick wrote, wrote about like she has an article called "You're so paranoid you probably think this is about you." <laughs> um, and I do think that is a common problem, especially now I think um, that feminist um, thinking is much more prevalent and like popular in with like middle-class Chinese women now, right? especially those who study abroad. Um, and it's, it is at a point where there's a lot of anger and a lot of like, um, which a very justified anger, right? And a lot of um, about kind of having your eyes open to all these things. But then, but then you're kind of, when you have a kind of this veil lifted <laughs> from, your, from your eyes and you see how um, oppressive everything it actually is it leaves you in a very actually very very sad place now that you see the world for what it is i mean that's the problem with a lot of critique and queer feminist politics and i think that there's a very emotional impact there that ha that um needs to be dealt with because we can't just live like that like <laughs> you know and we, we have to find another way to live of like, how do we, then how do we have relationships that are not oppressive, whether straight or queer? And how do we have fam interact with our families in a way that's not oppressive without being completely alone in the world? 
And how do we have um, lasting and secure um, kinship and attachments without those being conforming and constraining and um, yeah, and captive that still remain free and nurturing at the same time. <laughs> yeah, and those are like really hard questions. <laughs> And, and also regarding like the symbolic meaning of like something is bad that also ties back to our queer world making maybe there isn't like something bad maybe there isn't good or bad like fail or success or winning or losing like it's just about like the choice on or the experiences that people live and how different they are maybe that's a strong message to end today's discussion yeah, I think here's a good place to wrap up our discussion today yes yes thank you everyone for attending today's seminar and uh dr huang we do expect to see you more often you shared so much insights that we really appreciate your time and uh definitely looking forward to future sharing and also thank you everyone again for attending today's session and um yeah, I'll see everybody in two weeks in our panel discussion. And Yu Jie is also going to join us as one of the panelists. And uh, yeah, let's see who else we can. Li Mai Zhuoshi is probably a candidate that we can pull in as well. Let's have a let's have a um, a full party with all of our guests, the speakers in in this season. Uh, panel discussion in next two weeks and next season is all about embodiment and if i don't know if you're interested but uh, you're always welcome back as one of our guest speakers and talk about your experience as community building and uh, as an activist uh yeah i would love i would love to uh come, come more and also just be a student and learn from everyone else too <laughs> and learn from tori who's a really, really good teacher. <laughs> yes, everybody says that. Tara also looks forward for um Tori becoming a professor in LA <laughs> specifically. <laughs> no, 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 don't <laughs> don't have uh, like those high expectations of the future. <laughs> they will probably disappoint uh, sometime. <laughs> yeah, and I'm experiencing too much um, career failures. So <laughs> yeah, there's. <laughs> Yeah, I, I don't know. Um, but yeah, at least we have our next um season some seminars and uh yeah, actually trauma depression um uh, is uh featured in our uh, existing so was the the last episode episode five i was thinking of bringing in um emotion into the discussion effect um we'll be reading uh how to pronounce her name and that that or something I, I, yeah i love her work <laughs> yeah yeah i know like the depression and trauma is public feelings uh we'll be discussing that so um yeah if you're if you could join that would be definitely be great all right thank you thank you for attending i'll see you in two weeks thanks bye bye, bye.